something else than updating. Yeah, that is the change you can see here is due to the application of the very easy simple rules um, and is only updating the states of neighboring cells according to the state before. So nothing happens very complicated. And now you can accelerate this by the computer and then you realize that up to the generation 1100 or 3, yeah, uh, more than 1000 updating steps, um, it comes to a halt because nothing is changing again according to the rules and then the computer stops. So you see that in the meantime quite a number of forms have been generated um, all over the field, much larger than in the origin. Um, and this uh, has certain special features. For instance, if you update that for a while, then you see that suddenly there is showing up a special feature. On the left hand side, uh, the second, you see there is a structure bending upwards. Yeah? And if you accelerate this, you see, and if you watch the middle structure on the left hand side, the small one, consisting of um, five spots, you realize uh, it's too fast, you cannot actually follow it. But um, if we do it here on the small scale, so uh, now in this step we have now on 70 steps, now it's uh, dissolving from the left hand, the furthest left hand structure, and it's wandering upstairs. You see, it's wandering, 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 and it's running away, and now it's on the top of the page, and now, just on the furthest right downward end, there's coming a similar structure which is wandering downstairs. Yeah? And now on the left hand side you see a similar structure which is also wandering downstairs, and so on. You see, what is generated here is something which is actually not available, you see, because you have space that is represented by um, these uh, cells. Then you have time, which means that time is generated by the updating steps, but notice that the updating steps must not be linear, so in fact it's not clock time, it's an arbitrary time. Yeah? Nobody defines how long you are actually waiting uh, in between updating steps. And time and space together generate motion. But you know that no motion is actually happening because that is only the case because we let the computer run very quickly and our eyes cannot follow. That is the idea of movies, you know, of films. So, in fact, categories of space, time and motion are not really existing, but they are only cognitive properties of human beings and all the models we create are attached to these aspects such that we are actually able to talk about them because otherwise we would have difficulties. You see there is by the physicist there is a rule that time is only existing to make sure that not everything happens at once. You see, and because human beings would not be able to cope with that. And on the other hand, space is only there to make sure that not everything is lying on one heap. You see, so that uh, these parameters are ordering parameters, which are properties of human cognition, but not properties of nature. Yeah. 
So this is a good occasion and uh, I would suggest that you actually download this uh, by another occasion. You can see it on my lines actually. Um, and uh, thank you. So um, this is the aspect of network, but you see of course that network and or cellular automaton ba are based on the flow of information. Yeah? Or in other words, information is telling how to organize things. But you see immediately that information is not everything, because what you also need is energy. You see, um, it may be that an exchange of information is necessary in order to eventually build up a house. But this is not enough. You need the stones, you know, otherwise you will not have a house after all. And stones is matter, and matter is practically frozen energy, yeah, that is uh, a specific form of energy. So what you need is energy. Energy is giving you the uh, capacity to change things. And information is telling you how to do that, yeah? how to organize this change. So we have essentially two attributes we are dealing with, information and energy. Yeah? This is of course very similar to what Spinoza actually meant, but never could say. <laughs> So, uh, in fact, uh, as I said, uh, the best representation of a network is a graph, a mathematical graph, and the inventor of graph theory was Mr. Euler in 1736, one of the most famous mathematicians, um, because he was studying a very curious problem, which is, however, very practical after all, namely, he was trying to find crossing free paths over the bridges of the city of Königsberg in East Prussia. You see that uh, what you see here is, uh, of course, a simplified picture of the situation. You have an island and you have two arms of a river and uh, you have these bridges over the river. And obviously they are connecting three different parts. Um, of the city. Now the question is whether you can make a round walk without crossing the bridges twice. And that uh, sounds of course very curious, but the uh, very essential application is practice in the economy, because uh, that is actually a very important transport problem. How to transport goods such that you can minimize the route, the length of the route, because length of the route means money, you see, and therefore this is very practical indeed, although it looks like a kind of philosophical treatment. Now, um, what, what he did was to uh, make an abstract city, namely to shrinking the locations of points and expressing the bridges as links, yeah? So, uh, the locations uh, essentially, you see top, middle, down and right hand side. So you have four points which represent the areas and the bridges are the edges of the diagram, yeah, the links. And um, then you can find that um, nodes or, uh, or vertices with an odd number of links must be either starting points or end points of a journey. Yeah? That is quite obvious because, I mean, if you go back and forth, then you have two links or you have a multiple of two links. But if you start from one point and never come back, or you end at a point, never having been before there, then you have, of course, an odd number, obviously, yeah? because you're not coming back. And um, so such a path, therefore, if you will simply count, um, such a path cannot exist on a graph that has more than two vertices with an odd number of edges. Yeah? And the number of edges here is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So it's an odd number of edges. And um, on the other hand, um, you have uh, four vertices. Yeah? 
So Königsberg graph, so to speak, has four such nodes and therefore cannot be a pass, therefore in that uh, graph cannot be a pass of the desired kind. So what actually the people of Königsberg did was uh, they built a new bridge and in 1875 this problem could be solved. Yeah? But of course that is perhaps uh, uh, not something we should actually do also, but um, for the people doing their transport problems it would be very interesting. So now uh, comes uh, quite a lot of uh, of uh, properties on these networks, but I will not list all of them, I will just give you a qualitative uh, uh, explanation. So what you see here Uh, is actually a special graph of that kind. Uh, first of all, it's projected onto a sphere because that is uh, a bit easier to handle. But on the other hand, it's a special graph because it's a small world model. And we will see why. Uh, you have to note actually that on the far right hand side here, uh, you have the number 14, which is actually wrong because um, this is a printing error in the internet, yeah, because you have the 14 twice. So uh, this uh, shall be something else. Uh, uh, possibly, um, what is it actually? I think it must be number 11 or something like that. Yeah, but you can find out yourself. Now what you see here is simply a number of points that are connected by links. So that's a typical network structure. But there is a speciality, namely there are shortcuts. Yeah? You realize, for instance, that on the far left hand side, in the node number 5 can be easily connected with 11 on the far right hand side by a shortcut. Yeah? So you have only one step from the one side to the other. Um, while on the other hand you have other connections which uh, are of course only in the, working in the short range. In fact 5 to 11, that is uh, on the left hand side, 5 to 11, 13 to 17 and 15 to 18 are three shortcuts in that diagram. And that is actually the point why it's called a small world. I, because you see I uh, told you yesterday <coughs> that if you put for all these nodes the persons living on this planet and uh, the interactions between them as knowing face by face, I mean directly knowing as a, a mapping which is a link, yeah, then you need um, at most six such links in order to connect all people that are existing. But uh, of course that looks very curious but the reason is that the number of connections is uh, simplified, so to speak, um, according to the number of people such that it's growing much faster than the number of people can grow. We have uh, 6 billion people on Earth at the time being, yeah? and, uh, but the number of uh, links is uh, growing much more. So, um, in fact, in practice, you see, when I was in, uh, in the winter term 1999-2000, I was a, a fellow at Cambridge. Then my neighbor was a fellow from, Jap from Japan, from Tokyo. Um, uh, in fact, I've been to Tokyo, but only very shortly, so I know nobody in Tokyo. But <clears throat> by knowing this person, I know all the person he knows in Tokyo by two steps. Yeah? So I'm linked by uh, two such uh, steps to all these people I've never met and possibly will never meet. Um, so that is obviously a shortcut because one day I've met this Japanese fellow in Cambridge, England. You see? Uh, and of course, you can imagine that this happens very often. Yeah? 
So uh, I know in the meantime a lot of people in Leon in second generation, you see without having met them. Uh, and uh, so this uh, accumulates very quickly. Yeah? In fact, my wife, uh, who has done language examinations for uh, the members of the Regensburg uh, School Choir, which is a very famous choir in uh, Bavaria, uh, lots of little boys singing very nicely, you know, but they are visiting the normal school at the same time. So they have foreign languages and uh, she was doing the language uh, examination and the boss of that school was the brother of the last pope. Yeah? Uh, so you see that by this, uh, my wife is connected to the last pope who is still living, yeah? which is actually a historical sensation. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, by two steps, yeah, because she knows the brother, and from the brother to the other brother, one step, so two steps, and because the Pope is, of course, a representative of the Lord himself, she is connected by three steps to the Lord. <laughs> so that is, that is what we call small world model. Uh, okay. Um, now, um, you see, uh, if you remove these shortcuts, then suddenly it becomes more difficult to communicate between these mo all these nodes. And um, you have actually two schemes in order to describe that. Wait a second. Uh, namely, you define two types of matrices in order to give these properties. This is the first <coughs> matrix. Uh, this matrix deals with the example I've just shown you. If you read the lecture notes and you can go back to that diagram. Um, you have 20 nodes, you see, 20, 20. So you have a 20 by 20 matrix. And um, I have um, put in only uh, all those nodes who are separated by one step and they are characterized by a1 so that is actually called a neighborhood matrix or vicinity matrix because all these nodes are in the immediate neighborhood of each other so in fact normally you would uh, fill all cells with zeros if they have no direct connection and only the direct connection are the ones. But I've inserted here only the zeros which are immediately um, uh, attached to the ones. And you see that the shortcuts lead to off-diagonal elements in the matrix. Yeah? Because these ones here which are off-diagonal are due to the fact that you have three types of shortcuts in that uh, small world model. All the rest would be covered with zeros, but I've saved them. And uh, then, this is what we call the adjacency matrix, which is uh, quite a nice instrument for uh, networks. And this is uh, the, uh, uh, the matrix which is measuring the distance. Yeah? That's called distance matrix. Uh, namely, the distance measured in steps necessary in order to come from one point to the other. And you see 20 times 20 again for the nodes, and then all of them are connected, and of course the main diagonal of the matrix is zero, because one element is connected to itself by zero steps, uh, obviously. So this is excluded, and all the others give you the number of steps, and you realize that in that small world model, which has only 20 elements, um, the maximum distance is actually 4. Yeah? So that is a kind of tendency in order to show how the small world theory can be actually established. Yeah? Now, in fact, uh, uh, what I'm doing presently is to apply this to the Greek colonization of the Mediterranean, you see, because 
that is actually uh, how decentralized colonization is working and this was uh, already practiced by the Phoenicians in fact but they uh, did not develop fully fledged colonies but they uh, had to mainly trading colonies but the Greeks had to really um, say uh, products of the mother cities yeah, called metropolis yeah, metro, mother city and uh, uh, so they were sending out people in order to build up colonies which were Poleis themselves. Yeah. So in fact uh, there was not a Greek nation or a Greek country but what there was was a Greek network of states, of city-states. And uh, this was a, the, the prime paradigm of colonization for a long while, from 750 BC up to the late ancient times. And then it was destroyed after the onset of the Roman conquest because uh, the Romans took the same principle, they took actually a network of uh, colonizing cities, but they also took the surrounding area as a kind uh, of, uh, of region which was attached to a certain province capital. And therefore, the Roman Empire is what we call a territorial state. It's not, uh, in the end, it's not a network. And the territorial state was a paradigm which actually uh, replaced the network paradigm. And the idea of this research is now whether uh, in connection of the European Union and the uh, Mediterranean Union, you could actually find political means of organization which draw on both paradigms. Yeah? That is the, very shortly, that is the basic idea. So, um, in order to study such a situation, uh, we try to develop an online uh, model where you can, uh, for instance, uh, operate um, these networks such that, uh, for instance, you take away uh, certain links and um, you can check whether if you take away a certain number of links, the network becomes unstable or not. Yeah? And, uh, uh, this is, uh, of course, also uh, interesting in historical terms, um, but it's also important in structural terms, in, in an abstract sense. Of course, we have many possible networks. I will just uh, show you some of them. You see, for instance, uh, this is a very elementary network where the objects, the, the vertices, are abstract particles which actually do not exist but these are particles which uh, do nothing else they are practically they are group operators in mathematical terms and what they are doing is they send um, a special number to their neighbor yeah? and this number is actually a spin number it measures the spin which is the spin angular momentum of an elementary particle and uh, this is uh, therefore called a spin network and uh, has been invented by Roger Penrose. Um, and uh, uh, the numbers are the spin numbers actually which are available. The important point is here that if you collect all these numbers in a matrix uh, similar to the one I've shown uh, to you, then this matrix is a representation of a mathematical group which is called the spin group and this spin group is important for all we know about quantum physics. Yeah? Therefore, if uh, at the same time this is the elementary level of space and time, it's the smallest possible space which is achievable in physics so that you can say that space is quantized and um, so if you ask what the universe on the most fundamental level is doing all the time you can say it's computing yeah namely what is computing computing is processing information which is of structural quality namely processing spin numbers 
And that is actually what the computer normally would do. The difference is only that, first of all, this computer is hardware and software at the same time, yeah, which is different from the computers we are actually constructing. And uh, on the other hand, it's not a computer which is functioning according to Boolean algebras, but it's actually functioning according to Heiting al algebras, which means it's quantum computing. Yeah? So you do not have states 0 and 1, and you are processing zeros and 1s all the time, as a normal computer would do. But what you're doing is you also process all what is between 0 and 1. Yeah, and that is a quantum property. For instance, uh, the information state of 0 0.7 bits. Yeah, I would not know what that means, but uh, for quantum bits, uh, that is actually typically the case. Yeah. Um, but uh, to these quantum problems, I will come in the end, because that is a very interesting point in order to find a connection back to poor old Spinoza, you see, because what we call nowadays uh, quantum coherence is very similar to what uh, Spinoza called substance. Now this is of course a very well known um, network which is a reaction cycle. Yeah, this reaction cycle of chemical nature is a carbon cycle which was invented by Beta and Weizsäcker uh, and is describing the uh, energy process in the, in the stars. Yeah? So actually, um, this is a way uh, hydrogen is burned all the time into helium, and that is what the stars are doing all the time. Yeah? They are simply burning hydrogen, and once hydrogen is uh, vanished, then they are collapsing and uh, they have to break it down. In the case of our sun, this will actually need four and a half billion years, so it's not necessary to prepare your suitcases now. Now this uh, we have seen in the, uh, in the uh, uh, presentation of Gordana, that is of course a typically um, a complex network of the scale-free kind. Yeah? You can clearly recognize the subgroups sub which are forming. That is very similar to a social network because, um, in fact, uh, each person belongs to different networks. So um, you see a clustering in certain respects, but you see also um, a quite symmetric distribution in other respects. Um, but uh, the same is actually true for the production of biological species in normal genetics and all that sort. <clears throat> now, this is also a kind of network, but this is obviously um, not a reaction cycle, but it's more a reaction tree. Yeah? Ramon Rull uh, is greeting you because what you can see here is actually the developing of species of a special kind. Yeah? You, have, you see on the, uh, on the left hand side you have um, uh, fishes up to mammals, or, and actually on the far uh, upper left hand side are curious types of mammals called human beings. Yeah. On the right hand side uh, you have other types of uh, animals and so on. Um, so you find all these networks on various stages, but notice that you have two types essentially of such networks, namely active networks and passive networks. Active networks are those where the vertices are actually operating on other vertices by means of communicating links. Yeah? For instance, lime molds or as we have just seen, um, genetic species and so on. But you have also passive networks, and that is of the type of the Euler graphs, 
namely the bridges, you see, because uh, you can define roads over these bridges of Königsberg, but you must not necessarily use them. Yeah? That is, you have a network, but this network is waiting for application. So if nobody goes over these bridges, it doesn't actually matter, but the problem is nevertheless solved. Here it's very similar. What you see here is a cradle of European culture, so to speak, the Eastern Mediterranean. Yeah, it's only a section of it, the Greek section, but of course, as you know, what is Turkey now, that was practically Greece at that time, and on the right hand side, where you have the Levante, Lebanon and all that, this is a Phoenician area, which is actually the origin of that all. And on the base, you have the Egyptian part. All of that was, at, the, at this time, say 750 BC, was one cultural region. Yeah? They did not actually classify in different uh, sections as we do nowadays, because we differ, of course, between Europe, uh, Asia and Africa. That is uh, not what uh, Greeks were thinking about. Uh, of course, they noticed that different kinds of people are living there, but that was not important because most of them were talking in Greek, you see. And uh, of course, they also talked Egyptian and all that, but this was uh, not important for the communication. Um, uh, for instance, what we call Libya, Cyrenaica, is of course uh, a Greek foundation, yeah, Kyrene, and so on and so on. So uh, this was one area, and you can really call it the cradle of culture, of European culture, because European culture is obviously also Asian and African culture. Yeah? So um, this, however, is a passive network, because you see you have locations, you have the ocean, very important at the time. Um, all the transport is going via the ocean, not over land uh, lines and so on. Um, and uh, this is waiting for application. It's not active by itself, yeah? so it's a passive network. Here you have again uh, the interaction of an ocean with the countryside, and uh, humans are also involved, and here you can differentiate according to another system, consumers, producers, decomposers, and so on. Uh, so my students in Munich are very often decomposers, um, while I'm the producer and consumer at the same time. Um, and of course, that is coming into this. This is the worldwide air transportation network. Yeah. So very small dots you cannot recognize is a connection from uh, non-stop flight Munich Madrid. Yeah. Actually, it's very curious because I noticed that because of the half a year I'm in Berlin and I noticed I cannot go from Berlin directly to Madrid, which is uh, incredible because not even the capitals are directly connected. Yeah? So that I cannot actually believe that. Um, and uh, but you see that uh, uh, according to the color, this is clustered somehow, obviously. And um, uh, of course, you could study the, the clusters uh, and relate them to the communities and so on and so on. And uh, the same would be true, of course, for uh, internet uh, connections. Um, I, I have to state I cannot. Uh, I cannot abstain from stating um, uh, the quotation of Gordana at the beginning because uh, she said she would be happy to connect it with us and she said more or less exactly that this would be a very good illustration of the modern communication as it is actually constituted these days, you see, meaning a progress. And that is what I mean with optimistic because indeed we could listen to the talk of Gordana today, who is sitting in Sweden, but it needed a couple of hours of preparation. <laughs> and uh, and uh, sometimes uh, uh, not only the talk,
stone, but actually the picture was not very good. After all, it's never very good. I mean, independent of what you're doing. So, uh, so she's right. It was really a good illustration of the state of the art. <laughs> but, uh, well, uh, I'm joking, of course. So, so the matrix, uh, of course, uh, is, a, is a whole collection of parameters you can actually compute. In the lecture notes, you can read this in detail, and you can actually try that out, utilizing the small world model we have, or actually um, building up your own uh, model, you know, that is always very interesting. But what I would uh, do in the, uh, in the last part here of today's talk uh, is to talk on stochastic petri nets because that is a very special kind of network. But um, as it has turned out, this is very important in the universal sense. Um, uh, obviously, I've already indicated that there is a certain universality of applying networks. But petri nets are very special as to that because they are very uh, active in the sense. I, um, I've summarized this actually from a lecture course provided by John Bias and Jacob Biamonte, which is called The Course in Quantum Techniques for Stochastic Mechanics. And you can actually download these lectures from the Los Alamos archive. So what, what is that actually? Uh, now um, we talk here of species and uh, transitions. And uh, that is a very simple principle as indicated. <coughs> um, species is practically an object or a vertex. Yeah? Um, so what is happening is that you have now, that is uh, different from the usual networks, you have now a reaction arrow which is indicating the direction of interacting uh, activities and um, uh, the left and the right hand square is indicating a species but uh, the circle in the middle is indicating the type of interaction. You see that normally you are writing that onto the link or onto the edge of a diagram in order to qualify the kind of interaction, but in case of petri nets, you have an extra entry for that. Yeah. And um, now, what we have here is, for instance, a very special kind of interaction. Yeah, that is, of course, very unrealistic, but it's also very funny. It's an interaction between rabbits and wolves. Now, what, what we do here is the following. <coughs> we have two types, uh, actually three types of interaction. We have birth, predation and death. Birth means that rabbits are multiplying by splitting each other up into two samples. Yeah? So in terms of computation, you would say one rabbit in, two rabbits out. That is reproduction by fission. Yeah. Uh, it actually has not been observed yet, but it's, uh, of course, uh, an interesting model. Reproduction by? Reproduction by fission. Yeah. One rabbit is splitting into two rabbits. Okay. Now, predation, this is one wolf and one rabbit in and two wolves out. That is, the wolf is eating the rabbit and by doing so is reproducing to a second wolf. Yeah? That is also very unusual, but uh, works. So it's reproduction by fission after predation. And we have death, which means one wolf in and nothing out. Yeah? Uh, so the, the wolf is simply dying. But notice that no rabbit is dying unless it is eaten by a wolf. Yeah. 
So in order to summarize this in the diagram, you can draw the above. That is actually the form, yeah, so you have wolves and rabbits and um, so the first species displayed stands for rabbits, the second for wolves and the upper arrows count as double arrows, maybe back and forth because they have two, uh, two samples each time, namely producing two samples of a species, maybe two rabbits or two wolves while the lower arrows indicate one sample starting birth, that is creation on the left hand side, and one sample starting death, which is annihilation, one on the right hand side. The straight arrows show one sample inputs, yeah, one rabbit, one wolf. So the diagram represents these three types of interactions. Now, we can use that as a definition of petri nets. Petri nets consist of a set of species and a set of transitions together with a function S cross T, yeah, that's a cross product of species and transitions, up to N, which means the uh, natural numbers, saying how many copies of each species show up as input for each transition, and another function saying how many copies show up as output. Now the definition of stochastic petri nets is quite easy because you have another function which gives you the transition rate, and this transition rate is of course uh, due to coincidence, that is you have a probability distribution for these transitions taking place. In fact, that is very realistic because most of these networks are functioning in a stochastic manner. So what we have then is a rate equation telling us how the expected number of objects of each species changes with time. And we have a master equation telling us how the probability that we have a given number of objects of each species changes with time. So the rate equation is in a certain way deterministic, but a good approximation. But this is due to the fact that you average on that, while the other is of course a stochastic, stochastic equation. So now this Petri net is actually equivalent to the graph of a Feynman type, yeah? because you can uh, draw it this way. You have the rabbit coming in giving birth and going further, but it could also enter the predation zone given by a wolf and the wolf is going out instead of a rabbit or the wolf dies. Now if you shrink all these entries to a point and keep the arrows, then what you have is a Feynman graph. Yeah? That is a uh, instrument in order to describe um, the processes of quantum particle production. So what we have here is actually quantum physics in macroscopic biological terms, although we talk about animals which are very curious at the time. Of course, what you can do is to write this down in technical terms. What you have here is that you need three rate constants for the cases. Yeah? Beta, gamma and delta are related here to the rates of the types of interaction. And x of t is the number of rabbits and y of t is the number of wolves. So then you have the following system of equation. dx by dt, that is the rate of change in time of the number of rabbits, and dy by dt, which is the rate of change in time of the number of wolves is equal to the right hand side and the right hand side is determined by the rate constants and of course by the interaction. x times y means interaction and x and y single means that is what they do by themselves. Yeah. So we can actually call gamma 
which is uh, relevant for the interaction, we call, uh, can call the coupling parameter of the interaction involved. That is practically a measure for the strength of interaction. In fact, if you look closely, you realize that this is essentially the same as the Lotka-Volterra equations. And the Lotka and Volterra equations describe you the change in time of certain animal populations. And the Italian colleagues, Lotka and Volterra, have found that after World War uh, I, because they found that they had, contrary to what they would expect, uh, they had a disbalance in the available or availability, uh, it's difficult to say, <laughs> to the, um, to the uh, number of food fish as compared to sharks. And uh, you see sharks obviously feeding on these uh, fishes. And uh, the, the point was that they could establish a reproduction cycle which was actually generated by these equations and the solutions are sine and cosine functions which are shifted by phase such that if there is very many, very large amount of fish then obviously the sharks will be enjoyable, they uh, will enjoy this plenty of food and they will reproduce uh, in great numbers but the many sharks then will of course eat much more fish so they will reduce the number of fish quite considerably so that most of the sharks will have to starve and therefore reproduction will go down again and while the reproduction of sharks is going down the reproduction of the fishes is going up again because there are so few sharks and so it's actually a sine and a cosine oscillation and it has this phase difference which is uh, depending on the time uh, of uh, revitalization. Yeah. So that is actually what these equations essentially tell you. Obviously this is also true for very curious types of rabbits and wolves. Now you can uh, apply certain stochastic techniques which I would uh, not explain now uh, in detail. But uh, if you think back to the example we had with the slime mold, you can of course express slime mold aggregation as a petri net. And that looks very similar to this here. You have the population of amoebae, you have the aggregation procedure, you have the tight aggregate, we have the slug development, we have the fruiting body. The fruiting body is producing the germination of new amoebae and you are back with the population of amoebae. Yeah? To be more precise, this here is a cycle, but as I said, it's not really a cycle because the population of amoebae uh, is another one, a new one. So, in fact, you should draw it this way. Yeah, that would be more appropriate because you have the same cycle but the cycle is open-ended because germination produces a new population and then it's starting the cycle again but of course it is a different slime mold and so on and so on. Yeah? So you can expect that is essentially what we have discussed yesterday only expressed in terms of petri nets. But now remember the following It depends actually on the observer perspective. That is what uh, Gordana mentioned in the morning, but she referred to human beings. You see, human beings are full of meaning all the time. A verbe, one would expect, are not full of meaning, but actually they are because it depends on the perspective taken how to interpret this cycle. You see, if you take the perspective of the amoebae, then you would say, or I start with the slime mold, if you take the perspective of the slime mold, you would say, if the slime mold is asked, what are you doing all the day, in the 
know, the slime mold would answer, I'm reproducing myself. Yeah? I'm producing other slime molds, and whilst doing so, I do amoebae interaction. Yeah? I reproduce myself by means of amoebae interactions. But if you take the perspective of the amoebae population, the amoebae will tell you, actually, we are reproducing ourselves. Yeah? And we do that by producing a slime mold in, the, in between. Yeah? You see, uh, that is actually the same process, but it depends on the observer perspective how to actually interpret that. Yeah? And even in that very simple case of biological microorganisms, you have already this perspective dependence, which you would not actually expect, because for a single amoeba it would not be very interesting to know about a slime mold, you know. Possibly they do not reflect about that, although they are actually building the slime mold. But uh, that's not the point. That is true for human beings also. You see, if you have, uh, have a, a peasant here nearby, you see, uh, doing agricultural things such as, uh, I don't know, uh, 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 growing uh, wheat for, for baking bread or uh, feed uh, cows in order to get milk and cheese and so, um, he is of course producing that in order to sell milk and bread and butter and cheese, you know. But he, it's not necessary that he has studied economics. I mean, it's not, uh, not necessary that he knows how the, um, the state e economy is actually structured for the whole of Spain and the whole of Europe or whatsoever. What for him is in essential information is what the neighboring traders in the vicinity and the neighboring producers are taking as price. And then he is adapting his own price according to what he finds out about his neighbors. So in fact he is not doing nothing, then he is organizing his local life. But his local life, if summarized over all possible local lives, is in fact the same as the economy of the whole population. It's global economy. But he, it's not necessary that he knows about it. Yeah? So you see that human beings, although they are full of meaning, they do not know much more in the end than the slime mold or the amoebae would yeah? if it could reflect about the state of uh, the local processes. Okay. Of course, in mathematical terms, this is actually very elegant and you can simplify this, but I will not bother you with the mathematical details. But of course, for those who are interested in these details, you can actually... So, uh, obviously a petri net can alternatively be represented by a reaction network. These networks are well known from chemistry, of course, you know that possibly from school. Um, but of course, in that case, to the arrows you have also to write the uh, reaction rate constants, and uh, so you are not actually saving work when doing that. Um, now, what, uh, what you have also here is um, um, that uh, you have more complex um, networks. Uh, this is practically, with respect to the reaction network we just had, is a petri net which is essentially mapping the same result. You see that this is already becoming more complex in representation. And you have now, in practical terms, you have to decide what you would prefer. If you're talking about general structural aspects, it might suffice that you illustrate that in terms of a simple reaction network. But if you talk um, in detailed questions of uh, reaction rates, then it should be useful to take the more complicated form of the petri nets. 
And then, of course, you can define certain properties of these nets. There's actually one, uh, I will just make this short remark. Um, when describing Petri nets, there is one thing which is completely new in mathematics. You see, that has been found out one year ago, which is very interesting. What you can do here is you can, that is what is on the bottom of the page, what you can do is you can write down the exponent of a vector where the exponent is a matrix. Yeah, that is completely new. Nobody has actually worked with that. And Tobias and Diamante are the first one to do that. And of course, um, uh, this is very important for the other applications. In fact, as it turns out, um, as it turns out, petri nets are practically the equivalent, the macroscopic equivalent of quantum physics. That is, all the processes we observe in macroscopic terms, applying classical concepts of physics and mathematics, are a stochastic version of uh, normal uh, mathematical models we usually apply. But on the other hand, they are equivalent on the microscopic scale to what quantum physics is doing. So that we actually find the same type of equations. And I will show you that in a moment. Uh, here you see uh, a petri net which is dealing with reversible uh, processes. Yeah, obviously, you have to insert the respective arrows then. And of course, you get different results if you insert other arrows which close certain cycles. Then you can uh, discuss communication between the four uh, two species. The important point here is, and that is um, because in biology and physics and so on, people uh, won't actually notice it, but uh, only for social systems, but it's true for all of them. Communication between species in that terminology means that the species is actually changing. You see, that, that is an important point um, which uh, com social computation cannot actually uh, refer to because, you see, uh, you can discuss the interactions indicated by the arrows here. That is computation. Yeah? And obviously, via this type of communication, species A is discussing with species B, whatever the species may be. Of course, that can be two social human groups, but that can also be two uh, types of animals or whatsoever. But the point is that the very fact of communication is not simply trans uh, transporting information about the content of the communication, but is actually changing the species. So species A before communication is different from species A after communication. And that is of course particularly true for persons. And that is the reason why in the interpretation of these computational processes you have always a rest which cannot be fully interpreted because you have no direct access to this change of the person, you see. Of course, uh, for a movie it's not so relevant. The movie will not change decisively, but the person will actually, depending on the type of communication. Yeah? There is a, I, I have to admit, politically not very correct uh, statement of Jacques Lacan, who was the forefather of um, French psychoanalysis. and. Um, uh, and uh, um, uh, there is a famous quotation by him. Um, he said, um, if I say that I like this ragu of chicken, yeah, or whether I say I like this woman, is actually the same. 
But the difference is that I tell that to the woman, and that is changing everything, you see. And that, uh, I mean, it's, uh, well, <laughs> you know, like our own 60s. But, um, uh, but the fact is, that is essentially what is meant here. Of course, for psychoanalysis, it's much more important there, yeah, because it influences heavily the further, info, uh, the further interpretation. But it's actually true for all species interacting because the, the pure fact, independent of any contents, the pure fact that the communication takes place at all, in fact, it necessarily takes place in all cases you can imagine, uh, this fact is contributing to the internal change of the species. And that is actually what, according to my opinion, is uh, not referred to by social computation. So now what I have done here is now that I have applied this to, a, uh, to an example I'm just working on in the project, which is um, localized in the city of Berlin. It's actually the living quarter I've grown up a uh, long time ago. Uh, and uh, that is called uh, the Schöneberg Island. It's um, uh, not really an island. It's only called island because this area is cut out by three lines uh, of the city railway. Uh, so it's an indirect type of island. And it comprises of uh, uh, roughly 10 square kilometers with approximately 115,000 inhabitants. So it's a small quarter in a larger district. Um, the district altogether should have around 300,000 inhabitants. And this is about uh, the 12th part of the city of Berlin. Yeah? So Berlin is roughly about 3.5 million uh, people now. So uh, the island itself, so, so the district, uh, sorry, the district has 115,000, uh, the island itself has only 13,000 inhabitants. Now, um, the question is now how to model this with petri nets in the sense that the actors are the persons, of course, but um, you have in social systems, you have an intermediate level namely the group level, and uh, this is so because persons who are organized in a special group with special interests are practically acting as one person, yeah? a kind of super person consisting of the persons uh, that uh, are members of that group. And um, so altogether, this is one living quarter, and Berlin comprises officially of 97 such living quarters. Uh, and of course, you would have to do all the work for all these living quarters. Yeah? So what, uh, what you do here is the following. Um, uh, I have labeled here various such groups and the interactions in between them. Yeah? And um, uh, so the idea is, and that is described here on the top, if we assume that group types A through E show up in terms of numbers of species such that there are A groups, small A groups of type A, B1 and B2 groups of type B and so forth, then we have, for instance, this example for Petri Net, and uh, the groups are labeled here accordingly. Um, uh, quite obviously, you have a large number of groups and they are classified um, according uh, to their principal labels. For instance, um, you have here the numbers which are set to 100, uh, 30, 10, 5, 50, 30 persons. You see, these groups are not very large, but uh, substantially more than single persons. So altogether, only for one living quarter, you get 225 such interacting species altogether. And on the average, we have 50 to 60 members per species. And for the diagram, we have 
selected only 11 such groups of various types. And uh, the type is indicated in the notation of the index, which is attached to that. In fact, uh, obviously, I've not, uh, I've not listed here uh, the type of species, but for instance, these, they are classified according to educational state, to income, uh, to uh, everyday interests, yeah, like, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, collecting uh, uh, old uh, uh, discs or whatsoever. Yeah? Um, now, um, obviously, there are some interactions which are which go only in one direction, and the other are reversible, go in both directions. Uh, this is so because some of them are attached to certain institutions. Institutions are practically collections of groups, so to speak. Yeah, so they have another level of uh, the organization. <coughs> And um, I've actually demonstrated this in more detail in my forthcoming book on the, um, on the city space. Unfortunately, it's still in press. Uh, the publisher needs a very long, long time. And, um, uh, but uh, it's also, unfortunately, it's also written in German. Uh, but um, uh, then uh, there is more material insight in order to actually describe what these groups are all mean. So, uh, if you apply the chemical terminology, what you get is you have species, you have um, superspecies, so to speak, which in chemistry are called complexes, and you have hypercomplexes. These are the institutionalized groups. So, you have these levels. And uh, of course, for the whole city, you have to do that for each living quarter uh, um, uh, in, in a single mode, which is obviously something, some work for the computer rather than for humankind. So, um, for the usual city, we would uh, have at least five levels of organization above the individual inhabitants in the following fashion. And this is shown here, perhaps. This is one we can uh, magnify, because otherwise you would not be able to decipher it. Okay, yeah, that should be enough. Okay. So, what we have here is we have on the top, well, uh, that was. Uh, That was a bit far away. Yes. So, more or less. Well, <laughs> right. You know, we're going to see what we're going to do. Must have been nice. That is a little bit too. Okay. So that should be. So you see, the, the, the top level is of course the city the city level. Yeah, that would be the totality of Berlin. The city level is differentiated into districts, and the districts are differentiated into quarters. Yeah, that is shown here. Now the quarter is the hypercomplex. And that is consisting of complexes, which are groups of groups. Yeah. Now, the group is of course consisting of individuals. And the complex is consisting of several groups and the hypercomplex of several complexes. So all of that um, can be actually uh, reproduced in such type of tree. Yeah. 
And um, so what you have to do then is that for each box you are performing a round of these petri nets, which will of course very soon become very complicated. Just, uh, for instance, if you speak of Berlin, then you would have 225, that is the uh, number of groups in the quarter, times 10 times 12, 12 quarters altogether, 27,000 groups or species which are actually involved, you see. So the point of that is not to show how complex that is, because, I mean, obviously it will not be very useful to actually compute all of that. But the point is to show that this is the reason why political life, even on the level, on the level of small groups, is actually so difficult to manage. Because uh, whilst um, working on a consensus in the round of, say, three or four such groups which are interested in a special topic, you have to neglect, of course, because that is beyond your horizon of information, all the interests of the other groups which might overlapping without your knowing it, you see, and that is the point. So, uh, by performing a between that analysis, you could not solve every problem, but at least you could realize what kind of operation is actually relevant for groups which are not in your horizon of information. Yeah. And that is the important point. Because, you see, um, I mean, I'm coming back to the optimism uh, in terms of Cortana, yeah? Um, uh, the point is, not so much that you have technology which enables you to notice that there are other people, you see. I mean, if in former times I, I would have known 150 people and now I know 700 people, that might be fine. But the point is that 550 out of these 700 are possibly friends on Facebook, which are not actually friends, you see. So, um, I mean, they, they are simply saying, uh, hola, hello, you know, that, that is the interaction. And that is actually an interaction I could get rid of, yeah. You see, uh, the point is that I end up with 150 I would have known before the, uh, the entry of uh, technology. The important point is that nevertheless, you can get an advantage out of this possibility, namely, by searching for those aspects you would never encounter if you stay with your local perspective. And that is, uh, I think, the important point. But because you don't know where to begin, this is also the question of applying your hermeneutic principles, you see. So that with, only with computation it will not help because you can uh, compute all 27,000 groups here, but it won't tell you anything because you do not know what it actually means, you see. But you can only mean it if you can compare it with what you know. And you can only compare it if you are working in spaces which are actually overlapping. Yeah? So that you are really, um, you're really concerned with the issues which are important for groups you never meet after all. And you remember the small world model, you meet many people never in your life, but you're nevertheless very closely connected to them. You see, and that is what uh, this analysis uh, might be able to help you after all. So I, I, I may think that perhaps, yeah, that's very good, find to make an interval and continue tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.